Good morning. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, today we will talk about pulmonary and chest physical therapy and treatment techniques for patients who have pulmonary conditions or postural or need postural drainage, um, have a lot of mucus in their lungs. My computer is operating very slowly. So hopefully it will show up in just a second. Okay, hopefully you can see the slides. Um, if not, they are on Blackboard if you need to go on Blackboard and follow along. Okay, so the chest anatomy. So first, we want to talk about the difference between the right lung and the left lung. The left lung just has two lobes, superior and inferior. The right has three, superior, middle, and inferior. Um, inspiration is when we breathe in, it's pulling air into the chest, and the pathway that it goes is in the nose, down the throat, uh, into the lungs. In the lungs, it goes from the uh, bronchioles to the alveoli, and around the alveoli, there are capillaries. Um, Any time oxygen is actually transported into um, or out of the cell, the red blood cell, it happens at the level of the capillaries. So oxygen transport actually happens at the level of the capillaries. So once they reach the capillaries, the oxygen is transported into the um, red blood cell. Remember, it binds to hemoglobin. And then it is transported through the pulmonary veins. Veins return to the heart. It's the only vein that has oxygenated blood. Back to the heart goes through the arteries, arterioles, capillaries, and once it reaches the capillaries, the oxygen is released into the cells, into the tissues to be used. Um, I do want you to know that. <laughs> All these um, pathways, it's pretty basic, but remember kind of the pathways of how exactly it goes. Um, in inspiration, the primary muscles involved are the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. With the external intercostals, I want to just talk about that for a second. It's like having your hands in your pockets. So the fibers are going down and in. So if they were to contract, they pull the rib cage up and out for inspiration. So during inspiration, when you inhale, the chest wall expands and the rib, ca rib cage is kind of moved up to allow air to come in, to allow like a negative pressure to pull air in. Um, that is during inspiration. Now, expiration or exhaling, breathing out, is when you push air out. My uh, um, thing is making a bunch of noise over there. Um, and the pathway is the exact opposite. It comes from the tissues through the capillaries, goes through the veins up into the heart. Then from the heart, remember, it leaves through the pulmonary artery um, goes to the capillaries, and at the capillaries, it releases carbon dioxide in, out of the blood into the lungs to be breathed out of the mouth. Um, so the uh, release of that carbon dioxide happens at the capillary membrane, it goes into the interstitial space, and then it goes up through the alveola, then the bronchioles, trachea, and out the nose uh, or the mouth. And um, this is kind of a passive process. There's not a lot of muscle activation during expiration or exhale. Um, so the lungs passively recoil. Everything has been expanded and now it passively just kind of goes back to a recoil position and um, that causes the air to be pushed out. Now, if you're trying to force air out, like you're blowing out candles or blowing bubbles or something, then the muscles that are involved are the internal intercostal muscles, um, which, so the external were like your hands in your pocket, the internal are like you're pushing, you know, your hands up towards your nose. <laughs> um, and so the fibers go up and in, so when they contract, um, they pull the rib cage down and pull it into that motion to push extra air out. All right, a few terms that we need to know when we're talking about uh, pulmonary conditions. So tidal volume is the amount of air that's normally being um, 
breathed in and out. That's kind of your normal amount. Usually it's only about 10% of your total lung volume. So the amount when we're just sitting at rest and breathing in and out, that is our tidal volume. Inspiratory reserve volume, that is how much more you can push out. No, breathe in, because <laughs> we're talking about inspiration, inhale. Um, that's how much more um, that you can breathe in if you need it, like you're breathing in as much as you possibly can, filling the loves, lungs up. Uh, that is that inspiratory reserve, the extra amount you can breathe in. The expiratory reserve is the extra amount that you can push out. So after your normal breath, if you force more air out to the very most maximum that you can, that's your expiratory reserve volume. The residual volume is the amount that remains in the lungs at all times. This keeps the lungs inflated. If there was not any air in the lungs, then they would collapse. And so there has to be some air remaining in the lungs just to keep it inflated. That is the residual volume. Inspiratory capacity is your tidal volume plus your inspiratory reserve because it's everything you could possibly um, um, breathe in. So after you've exhaled, you take the biggest breath possible. That's your inspiratory capacity, how much you can breathe in uh, versus your uh, functional residual capacity it's volume of air after a normal exhale so that's your residual <clears throat> residual volume and your expiratory re reserve so after you've done just a normal breathing out there's a certain amount your functional residual capacity meaning functionally this is what remains in your lungs after you breathe out to keep the lungs inflated vital capacity is um, your, oh yeah, um, the exchange between the maximum inhale and the maximum inhale, exhale. Maximum inhale to your maximum exhale. That's your vital capacity. If you breathe in as deeply as you can and breathe out as deeply as you can. Uh, so in order to get the number, if you know inspiratory reserve, tidal volume, and expiratory reserve, add those together and that's your vital capacity how much you can possibly breathe out and in if you're forcing the most air possible. And then your total lung capacity. This is all the volumes put together. So your tidal volume, your inspiratory reserve, your expiratory reserve, and your residual volume. If you add them all together, that's the total lung capacity. How much air the lungs can possibly handle total lung capacity. Uh, the physiology. So we've talked about this and we already talked about the pathway that it goes through. Um, but what we didn't talk about is the difference between ventilation and respiration. Ventilation is just the movement of air. So if somebody's on a ventilator, it's just pushing air in and out of their body. It can't actually make the air usable by the body. Respiration is that the actual gas exchange within the body that allows you to pull the oxygen out of the cell and or out of the red blood cell and into the tissue and then push the carbon dioxide out of the body that is respiration so the actual exchange of gas is respiration versus ventilation is just movement of air so even if air is coming in and out if maybe they have sickle cell anemia or they have um, something at the cellular level that decreases the amount of oxygen um, transported to the tissues, then respiration is still affected. And they're still not getting as much oxygen as they need, even though the air is moving in and out. Um, so, of course, we know the air comes in through the mouth or nose, down the trachea, travels in the lungs, bronchioalveoli, like we talked about before, capillaries, and in the capillaries it binds to the hemoglobin. Once it is carried away from the lungs through the pulmonary veins, it goes into the heart, it's plumped Plumped, pumped out through the body and then um, once it reaches the capillaries that is when respiration begins so all those areas we were talking about we're only talking about ventilation air is just moving to different areas but once it reaches the capillaries is where ventilation no respiration sorry respiration begins. Respiration begins at the level of the capillaries. Okay, so with respiration, this is the gas exchange. 
here it's showing it in the lungs. So that's when the oxygen is coming in and the carbon dioxide is being pushed out. So this is respiration at the lungs. Um, in the tissues, it's actually um, the opposite way. The oxygen is coming out of the cells into the tissues and the carbon dioxide is um, going uh, into the blood to be removed from the body. So this is at the level of the lungs and then uh, in the uh, tissues, it's kind of the opposite way. So oxygen goes out of the red blood cells. So let's say if it was coming from the tissues here, this is not exactly what this picture shows, but if it was coming from tissues here and it had oxygen, then right here, the oxygen would go out of the red blood cells and into the tissue. And then the carbon dioxide that's in the tissues from the last um, byproduct of the usable oxygen, then would go into the blood cells and that deoxygenated blood would travel through the veins back to the heart. Um, so the oxygen, when it diffuses, it goes through the cell membrane and into the mitochondria of, um, once it goes in the tissue, it goes in through the mitochondria. Um, the byproduct we already talked about, carbon dioxide, diffuses out of the cell, it goes into the capillaries, and it travels to the heart, then to the lungs, and then uh, through the interstitial space, and then it goes alveoli bronchioles out of the, up out of the body. Um, when it's coming in the lungs, of course, it's the opposite way. Oxygen comes in and it uh, connects to the red blood cells and it travels through and releases its carbon dioxide and then goes on back to the heart through the pulmonary vein. Auscultating lung sounds. Um, so this first, um, these pictures are just showing you kind of where to listen to the lung sounds and what you're listening to. So if you're listening in this region, it's the right upper lobe, right middle lobe, right lower lobe, left upper lobe, left lower lobe, and then same in the back. Um, so typically um, a medical doctor will listen over the trachea and they'll go, um, at the top portion of each lung, then they will go the left upper, right upper, right lower, left lower, and then on the back, they'll go through that same similar zigzag pattern. Um, so just kind of a pattern of auscultating where they listen to. Now PTs will occasionally listen for breath sounds, you know, if something's happening, some the condition has changed and we need to figure out if we need to call ambulance or what, but typically it's left up to the medical doctor, but it's nice to know what they are and what they mean so that as you're reading a chart, uh, you have a better understanding of what's going on. So we're going to listen to some lung sounds um, and um, talk about what they are. So the first, we're going to talk about normal breath sounds. The first one is a vesicular sound. It's a high pitch, it's a soft rustle during inhale and at the start of exhale. Uh, with silence by the end of exhale. So here is what it sounds like. Vesicular breath sounds. Okay. And if you can't hear it, um, I have the video link on the next slide, at the bottom of the next slide. Uh, you can go to it there, or I can put it also in the comments on the play posit. Okay, diminished breath sounds, that is vesicular sounds um, or low intensity sounds. So it's often in elderly people or in people with a lot of tissue blocking. So it's just diminished. It's a normal breath sound but it's just not as strong as um, it typically would be. So this is what a diminished breath sound will sound like. I can't hear it. <laughs> okay. With bronchial, now all these are normal, remember. It's louder, it's more hollow, it, more, it echoes a little bit more and it's throughout inhale and exhale, it can also be heard uh, in patients with pneumonia. So it could be abnormal, 
um, but typically bronchial is normal. Um, so let's listen to bronchial. So it's just more hollow, more echoey. Now let's talk about adventitious breath sounds. These are abnormal breath sounds. This cues you into something is going on at the level of the lungs. It's not, uh, they're not clear and great. <laughs> so bronchi, bronchi uh, that's a continuous low pitch sound. It's almost similar to snoring or gurgling. Um, it can be heard in inspiration and expiration and it's caused by mucus. And if you cough, it typically is cleared up and goes away. Um, so that is bronchi. And then they also refer to them here as low pitch wheezes. Very hard to hear. Okay, I'll turn the volume up so maybe you could hear it again. You can listen to it on your own as well. Crackles, that's a discontinuous high pitch popping sound heard most often during inspiration and that is associated with restrictive or obstructive lung dis disorders. So high pitch popping sound, it's discontinuous and it's associated with restrictive or obstructive lung disorders. Kind of like you're stepping on a pile of leaves. A wheeze, that's more of a whistling musical sound during inspiration, could be also in expiration that changes from one minute to, an diff to the next and from area to area. It's caused by narrowing of the pathways and it's pretty typical in patients with asthma, especially if they're having an asthma attack. So you may have heard it before when someone was having um, an asthma attack. These are wheezes. So it's a whistle because the air is getting trapped in a narrow space. Reminds me of a whale, a whale sound. Um, okay, strider, continuous high pitch wheeze. It's heard during inspiration and expiration, and it's called by, it could be caused by pertussis, by croup, by aspiration, by anything like that. So you may have heard of strider before if somebody swallows a drink the wrong way and aspirates. Um, they have a couple of different wheezes on here. All right, here's Strider. That's pretty rough. Um, that tells you something's really going on. So if you have water down the pipe, <laughs> could happen. <laughs> Sorry. Um, some of y'all say bless you. <laughs> um, and, you know, when you swallow the wrong way and then you're coughing and then when you start breathing again, it makes that kind of funny noise. So you may remember that. And then the plural rub is a whole different video. Um, so it is a dry crackling sound it can be heard during inspiration and expiration and it's caused by either a pulmonary embolism or pneumonia so something that really definitely needs medical attention um, and that is 
a plural My friction row. To make college easier because students come on now. A lot on now. Like hard work and economy. So this next one video we're going to discuss what dead is often described the toy sound of dead. Okay, that's a nice calm sound, makes you want to go to sleep. Okay, but that's a sign of pneumonia or a pulmonary embolism. So you don't want to hear a plural friction rub. Okay, types of respiration. So there's different types of respiration. Hyperventilation, most of us are familiar with. When you are uh, breathing too quickly and really the danger in hyperventilating is you're pushing off too much oxygen. I mean, sorry, <laughs> carbon dioxide. You're pushing out too much carbon dioxide and that can affect the blood pH. It can cause you to faint. The good thing about the body, it's just amazing how it's put together. You know, you have, you're breathing too fast. You're pushing off too much carbon dioxide. The, um, you faint and your head goes lower and your respirations immediately slow down. Um, and your body is able to regulate itself. So it's just pretty cool how the body works. Um, Cheyenne Stokes are irregular breathing patterns. It's typically with sleep apnea. So you may have experienced or heard this before. It's kind of a fast, shallow breathing and then a heavy breathing. And then there's periods of no breathing. So it's a quick, rapid, shallow breathing, a heavy breathing, and then the breathing stops. That's a sign of sleep apnea. And so this typically is seen while people are asleep. Uh, tachypnea is just rapid breathing, abnormally fast. And then Kuzma um, breathing is deep, labor breathing. Uh, could be somebody that has is in diabetic ketoacidosis. So they're trying to push more acid off um, because there's too much in the bloodstream because of the buildup of ketone bodies. Remember we talked about that in class last week um, and these are just different types of breathing that you may come across. Okay so we, last week we talked about metabolic acidosis and alkalosis but now we'll talk about respiratory acidosis and alkalosis. So with metabolic uh, you've either consumed too much acid or basic products um, or you pushed out either through vomiting, diarrhea, anything like that too much of a product, either a basic or a, um, acidic product. And with respiratory acidosis, the key player is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is slightly acidic. And if too much is in the bloodstream, then we have respiratory acidosis. If too little is in the bloodstream, we have respiratory alkalosis. Um, so when it, there's too much building up, um, uh, with respiratory acidosis, um, then it increases the respiratory rate in order to push out more carbon dioxide. So when you have respiratory acidosis, you, your uh, respiratory rate increases to try and push out more carbon dioxide. With respiratory alkalosis, there's already too much um, carbon dioxide being released. Like with somebody hyperventilating, they're already pushing too much out. So the respiratory rate needs to slow down in order to stabilize the blood pH um, or to neutralize it. So uh, you've seen a movie, somebody's, um, you know, freaking out or whatever, and they're hyperventilating and then they breathe in the bag. They say it's really not effective because it's really not trapped. The thought is you're trapping the carbon dioxide in the bag. And so when you're breathing in, you're breathing in carbon dioxide with oxygen. They say it's not really effective because the bag is porous enough. It's not really changing how much you're breathing in. But what is effective is it makes you more aware of how fast you're breathing and can help slow down your breathing. So it's just as effective to tell somebody who's hyperventilating, slow down, breathe in the nose, blow out the mouth. For kids, and I use it for adults too, but definitely for kids, I used to always use smell the roses, blow out the candles. 
and that can really help slow their breathing pattern down um, just as well. Okay, so now we're going on to some of the pulmonary disorders or diseases. So chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This is a group of lung diseases uh, that block airflow and the airflow is blocked because the bronchioles are narrowed. Um, so it can be caused by chronic inflammation and that ends up changing and remodeling the tissues themselves throughout the lungs. So that narrows the airways. So the inflammation uh, brings products there that end up changing, remodeling the, the um, airways themselves, narrowing them. The parenchyma is the functional part of the lung. The portions that allow oxygen to be exchanged are damaged. And then uh, pulmonary vessels thicken. So see how the blood vessel is thickening. Um, so the thickening restricts the airflow even more. Um, when they try to exhale, the airways actually prematurely close. So when you inhale, you are pulling air in and then like a door basically closes to keep the air in. <laughs> and then when you exhale, it has to open back up, allow the air out, um, and then eventually allow the air back in. But what happens with COPD is the airways, you're, you're pushing air out and the, the door basically closes too fast for enough to get out. So it traps air in the lungs. The airways close prematurely. You're trying to exhale and they close on you and air is now trapped in the lungs. Um, that trapped air means there's decreased space available for new air to come in for, with new oxygen. Um, and so then your carbon dioxide levels are higher in the lungs than they should be. The oxygen levels are lower than they should be. And it sets you up for hypoxemia, low oxygen levels throughout the blood. Um, then there's also more carbon dioxide in the blood, which can also change the blood pH. Um, two of the common diseases that are under the umbrella term of COPD are um, emphysema and chronic bronchitis. So we'll talk more about those now. With emphysema, the alveolar walls are destroyed um, and are more like just gaping pockets. So this is a nice, nice healthy alveola, and this is the ones that are destroyed. So they are smaller and they have big gaping holes and they're less efficient. Um, the, the phrase for emphysema um, is a pink puffer. They typically have a kind of pink appearance to their skin. Air is trapped in the lungs, which causes a barrel chest, like um, kind of like a broadening of the rib cage. And that is the puffer portion of pink puffer. They end up having shallow breathing. There's a pink tint. There's decreased oxygen uh, exchange within the lungs. So it's still... They're still out of breath. They still aren't able to use the oxygen as well, um, but the air is getting trapped in the lungs. That's emphysema. With chronic bronchitis, um, the bronchioles are what are constricted. There's inflammation, there's mucus, and that causes them to be thinner. And this is known as the blue bloater. So the restricted airways make it difficult to get oxygen in. Remember, there's carbon dioxide trapped already in the lungs, less oxygen is coming in the lungs, and so then there's deoxygenated blood staying in the bloodstream, and this is what causes that blue appearance, and uh, it also causes systemic edema. The body is keeping more blood in the area to try and get as much oxygen as possible, and so there is some swelling and inflammation throughout the whole system. So that's why it's a bloater. It's blue because it's deoxygenated blood, bloater because there's edema throughout the system. That is chronic bronchitis. With restrictive lung disease, this is also a group of um, diseases. It's characterized by difficulty expanding the lungs and reduced lung volume. So with COPD, the difficulty was getting the air 
out in and out of the lungs there's a or there's a um, obstruction something in the pathway that is causing the air to get stuck in versus with restrictive lung disease there is a difficulty expanding the lungs so it decreases the lung volume so less space for oxygen to enter um, some of those restrictions could be um, due to a disease in that alveolar parenchyma remember parenchyma is the functional portions of the lungs so if they're damaged the lungs uh, have less function and or it could be a disease of the pleura it could be changes in the chest wall um, like maybe with Parkinson's disease where the chest wall and the spine all become more rigid and less mobile could be an alterations in neuromuscular apparatus of the thorax so like maybe a spinal cord injury now they don't have the muscles of inspiration available to broaden the um, rib cage and allow air in because they've been paralyzed and then now they have restrictive lung disease because they don't have the muscles that are pulling the um, rib cage apart to allow more air to enter so those are some of the possibilities of why uh, what the, what is causing the restrictive lung disease but the signs are dyspnea you know that is uh, labored breathing shortness of breath non-productive cough rapid shallow breathing limited chest expansion uh, inspiratory crackles digital clubbing and cyanosis so cyanosis is that kind of blue appearance around the mouth uh, because of um, less oxygen um, delivered there it can also be at the tips of the fingers if they kind of white or blue in appearance they're not getting enough oxygen clubbing is over time when there's decreased because the the blood the last place the blood gets to is the fingers and toes <laughs> so um, by the time it gets there it may already be fully out of oxygen and um, so typically those the ends of the fingers and toes are what suffer the most and over time when there is chronic um, hypoxemia low blood in that area in your fingers and toes the um, area will actually swell trying to keep more blood in to get the oxygen it needs and so that's called clubbing of the digits so it could be the fingers or toes but they look thicker at the end because of chronic hypoxemia low oxygen levels all right with asthma this is a chronic airway inflammation it could be due to hyperactive or a hypersensitive airways and so they cause spasms so they react when they shouldn't or they are sensitive to things that you know it wouldn't normally be so sensitive to and they react by spasming um, the spasm of course is known as an asthma attack and it is reversible um, oftentimes if they have it as a child they may grow out of it uh, not everybody does and then um, during episodes they have wheezing they have coughing they have breathlessness and as you've seen typically people with asthma will have some type of inhaler and it is a um, steroid that immediately um, <clears throat> dil not dilutes dilates dilates immediately dilates the vessels to open them up so that the air can get back in so right now they're in spasm and they're all constricted and no air can get in you take you puff on the inhaler and there's a steroid in the inhaler that causes them to relax and allow air back in um, typically we don't see a lot of people with asthma we don't necessarily treat just specifically asthma but we may see a lot of people that come in that have it as a comorbidity so you can educate them you could help with airway clearance or breathing exercises you could teach them relaxation techniques you could strengthen um, their muscles of inspiration and do some endurance training but typically they'll be there for probably another condition and that might just be something a comorbidity that you're also treating all right with cystic fibrosis this is a congenital disease um, so someone is born with it and it's that the excretory glands produce viscous thick secretions it's a defect of chromosome 7 and the secretions throughout their entire body not just in the lungs are thicker 
and um, more sticky. Okay, and so those thick secretions can lead to lung infections. They can also mess with the pancreas. They can inhibit digestion and food absorption. Um, they also can affect um, um, reproduction. There's, there's a lot of things that they affect. They don't just affect breathing, but they definitely have a large effect on breathing, but they also affect the ability to absorb nutrients, the ability to um, reproduce all of those things. So some of the systems that could be affected, of course, the pulmonary, pancreatic, hepatic, sinus, and reproductive. Um, the most common cause of morbidity is damage to the pulmonary system. So eventually it's like their lungs fill up more and more with fluid and it's uh, it's essentially, they get to a point where they kind of drown in their own fluid, unfortunately. The um, life expectancy used to be really low in the recent years with medications and different changes they've made and found in medicine. They have a higher life expectancy and they're seeing that some people who are able to live long enough are able to reproduce, which they thought impossible um, some years ago. And so uh, that's encouraging, but it's still eventually... Um, there will likely be some complications, whether it's an infection because of the constant fluid in the lungs or the lungs just filling up so much with fluid that they're not able to get the oxygen they need. PT can include airway clearance techniques, breathing exercises, assisted cough, and training of the muscles of ventilation. And we'll go specifically into each of these types of physical therapy shortly. Some of the other pulmonary disorders that everybody's heard of pneumonia, it's just inflammation of the lungs. It's typically caused by an infection. Pulmonary edema is just inflammation within or fluid within the lungs. Um, it's in the alveoli and it makes it difficult to breathe. Um, pulmonary embolism is a blood clot to the lungs, so it's blocking um, an artery in the lungs. And of course, it can be life-threatening. It requires immediate attention um, blood thinners will be given anticoagulants in order to break up the clot and allow you to breathe again. If you can't get oxygen in, um, it's a medical emergency. Okay, so now what do we do for patients who do come in with uh, pulmonary disorders? This is kind of a roadmap of what we're going to cover, but you could use any of these techniques depending on the, what the patient needs and what their abilities are. So you could use chest PT, you could use postural drainage, aerobic training, breathing exercises, and general strength training. With chest PT, um, it's a method of manually assisting patients with airway clearance in order to get the secretions out of their lungs. Um, so when they have too many secretions, that's just thick fluid in their lungs, uh, then ventilation is affected. So not only is respiration affected, the movement of air, but ventilation itself, the movement and the exchange of uh, gases is also decreased. Um, and then the way that we do the chest PT um, is we cup our hands and that's percussion. We're about to get the percussion. Chest PT can, can include percussion and posture drainage and many other things. We'll get specifically to the technique in just a minute. Um, but we typically like to perform airway clearance techniques before we have them exercise so that we get secretions out, we allow them to breathe, breathe better, and then they're able to do their exercises without getting so out of breath. So this would be kind of the thing that you do at the start of treatment is the chest PT. So things that can indicate that there is a need for chest PT is, um, if the patient is retaining secretions, if they're having fluid uh, buildup or mucus buildup in the lungs. Um, if they've re had a recent surgery and they're in the bed a lot or maybe, um, you know, a bad infection in the, in the bed a lot, you could do it just to prevent the buildup of fluids and prevent the possibility of them getting pneumonia. Um, they could be, use it if the doctors want a sputum sample, that is the mucus after you cough it up, it's sputum. Uh, so it could be done to produce that. Could be done just for any patient that's having difficulty clearing the secretions themselves. How do we usually clear them? By a cough. We typically cough to clear the secretion. So if they can't cough and clear their airways themselves, 
then this is a way to help them. And then atelectasis. So this is um, a complete or a partial collapse of the lung. And if the collapse is related to a mucus plug, an area that's getting blocked off and the air is not able to get in because it's plugged up, then that would be an indication to do some chest PT. If it's collapsed from injury, it would not be an indication for chest PT. Methods of airway clearance. We'll go over some of these more specifically. There's postural drainage, percussion, vibration and shaking, directed cough and huffing, active cycle breathing, airway oscillation, positive expiratory pressure, high frequency uh, chest compression device, that's this right here, and uh, breathing exercises. Postural drainage. So essentially you are putting a patient in a position where gravity pulls the drainage up and out of the lungs. So you position them where the um, bronchi of the involved lung is perpendicular to the ground. So you're trying to use gravity to be as upside down as possible. So you look at the position of the bronchioles, which is a little bit different in the different lobes. So depending on what area of the lobe is most congested, that determines which position you put them in. And um, want that portion of the lobe to be as perpendicular to the ground as possible. Um, so typically we can't get fully perpendicular, so we just slant towards the ground, um, but it uses gravity to move the secretions, and uh, there are different positions based on each lung, lung segment, so I would certainly look at that in your book to determine which position is best for the patient. Typically, we don't do like this position. We're just slumped over pillows. This one, we're also slumped forward over pillows, typically, um, but each position is maintained for two to three minutes. Here's another picture of the positions. There they are slumped down a little bit more and slumped over the pillows. And this tells you which lobe um, they are targeting by that position. So I would definitely look at those and kind of be familiar with those. You don't have to necessarily memorize, but just get an understanding and try and visualize in your head how the bronchioles are placed and um, are positioned and what position they need to do to have that pointing down towards the ground. Contraindications. So if they have a high intracranial pressure, if they've had a recent neck injury that's unstable or head injury, if they are actively bleeding or have blood instability like they clot easily or uh, bleed out easily, if they've had a recent spinal surgery, active hemopt hemoptysis, uh, coughing up blood, um, <clears throat> I don't know what empyema is. I forgot to look that one up. We'll have to look that one up together. Um, bronchopleural fistula, pleurodema, effusion. So if there's fluid buildup significant where it's hard for them to breathe, they probably can't tolerate these positions. If there's a pulmonary embolism, you do not want to um, push that out while it's clotted. So the way to get rid of a pulmonary embolism <clears throat> is uh, blood thinners, not by causing it to just break away and then go out because then it's a blood clot that's loose in the bloodstream <clears throat> and it could go to the heart and cause a heart attack or go to the brain and cause a stroke. So you want to break up the clot and not just remove the clot from where it's positioned. If the patient can't tolerate it, maybe because they're confused or agitated, if there's been a rib fracture or any type of surgical wound in the area, all of these would be contraindications for postural drainage. Now, some of the postural drainage is done in the Trendelenburg position. So these are contraindications. Hemoptosis, hemoptosis. Okay. Um, sorry, I didn't realize it was on both slides. Um, contraindications for Trendelenburg. So if you're doing a different position, you may be able to do that even if they have something like this going on. But if you're doing one where the head is lower than the heart, then you don't want to place the patient in that if they have significantly high uncontrolled blood pressure. If their abdomen is distended because that can cause too much um, fluid backup in the area, uh, esophageal surgery, if they're coughing up blood, uh, or if they have uncontrolled airway or risk for uh, aspiration. So if while the mucus is coming up, they're at risk for choking on it, 
then you don't want to put on that uh, either or recent tube feeding where they could have some um, fluids coming up from the stomach then you don't want to have the head lower than the heart all right percussion that's what I started to tell you about too early earlier you cup your hands and you bang on the person's chest wall so it's kind of like banging on a drum you cup the hands and do kind of a rhythmic beating on the chest wall typically it's done for three to five minutes i kind of like doing it so i'm just gonna keep on <laughs> um, it shouldn't be painful for the person and the whole purpose of it is to release the secretions from the chest wall so as there is sticky mucus it kind of gets stuck to the uh, chest wall and then percussion can help loosen it up so it falls away so that it can be coughed out if they have a rib fracture flail chest which is basically there's a portion that is not connected and it's kind of flopping around um, osteoporosis so their bones break easily if they're elevated coagulation studies so remember we're talking about hemoglobin and hematocrit those values we learned in class last week if they're too high and they could possibly either bleed out or clot too easily or um, anything like that then you wouldn't um, then you wouldn't uh, do chest percussion and if the platelet count is too low so then the, that would cause the bleeding out the coagulation being too high would cause the blood clot the platelet count being too low could cause bleeding out so those are times that you would not do chest percussion vibration you do a bouncy force through the hands and oftentimes i'll get on both sides of the lungs and do a bouncy force kind of in and up it's a vibrating bouncy force kind of in and up um, or if you're together then you go up and in same <laughs> um, then um it's applied to the rib cage it's while the patient's exhaling so they take a deep breath in and while they're exhaling you go uh, vibrate up and in Ugh. sorry <laughs> in the book it calls it shaking so same thing you typically do it for five to seven deep breaths um, and then it helps remove the secretion it helps increase that mucociliary transport remember we have those little hair cells that kind of wave and help get um, mucus out of our system that's kind of what causes the cough is a quick reflex of all the hair cells to push it upwards so it helps activate that system so that the hair cells kind of wake up and are more active in getting the secretions out uh, it has the same precautions that we just learned as percussion so if any of those uh, precautions right here are noted then they cannot do percussion or vibration all right with directed coughing this is just teaching somebody how to do a more effective cough so if they're coughing but not getting any secretions up this could be something that you could teach the patient um, so that they get to a place where they're able to actually get the mucus out so um, coughing is actually the most common and the easiest way to remove secretions and to clear their airways it's kind of how our body naturally does it so you could sorry, teach the patient um several ways of doing it first you have them inhale as much as they can they hold that breath two seconds then they push against a closed glottis so they're not exhaling they're exhaling against nothing they're just kind of increasing the pressure in their chest um, and then they cough two or three times and while they cough there's some pressure around the chest or the abdomen um, so in the first picture she's using the pillow to do pressure the next picture she's using her own arms to do the pressure um, and in the last picture the therapist is actually adding the pressure herself as the patient coughs if you are doing that i personally would say stand behind the patient if possible because you don't want to get coughed on um, but one way we learned in class uh, in school that i couldn't find any pictures of is a towel you can have a patient wrap a towel around their um, back and then cross the tail in front so they're hand is holding each side of the towel and they hold it and when they cough they lean forward and they pull the towel tighter so the towel is wrapped around and crossing in the front and as they cough they pull it in opposite directions so that it kind of squeezes their um, chest wall 
So they still take as much of a breath as possible, hold it in, push out against the closed glottis to increase that pressure, and then cough three, two or three times. And when they cough, each time they pull that towel around them to force um, more air and more mucus out. Huffing is uh, just a forced exhale against an open glottis. So it's like, um, kind of like, you know, a forced blowing out of the candles or something like that. But they inhale deeply and then they contract their abdominal muscles to huff. So it's like, huh, huh, <laughs> I never can do it without laughing. Try and do it at home and see if you laugh. Because I guarantee if you do it enough, <laughs> it makes you laugh. Um, and that is huffing. And that is actually one of the best way to milk secretions up. What the huffing does is it gradually milks the secretions up from the smaller vessels to larger and larger vessels to then be um, coughed out. And so typically you'll have them huff until they feel the need to cough and then they cough. And then do it again, repeat the cycle several times. Um, so if the patient is likely to pass a disease from coughing or huffing, then that would be a contraindication. Um, these are contraindications to coughing and huffing, by the way. If their intracranial pressure is too high or there's a brain aneurysm, these both will increase the intracranial pressure short term, so you don't want to do that there. If there's decreased coronary artery perfusion, acute unstable head or neck injury, uh, potential for regurgitation or aspiration, if there's a recent abdominal pathology, aneurysm, hiatal hernia, even pregnancy. Pregnancy, I think, uh, use your judgment on that. It's more of a precaution. Uh, untreated pneumothorax, osteoporosis, or flail chest. All of those would be contraindications to the um, assisted coughing or the huffing technique. Now, on the right here, I think several of these could be... Um, more of a precaution, especially with the huffing. With the coughing, if you're adding force to the chest, then definitely you don't want to do it if somebody's likely to get a fracture. But huffing, if all they're doing is huff, <laughs> then they should be okay to do that even if they have osteoporosis. So some of those, um, you can use your best clinical judgment based on the patient's case. Active cycle breathing technique. This is actually been found to be one of the best techniques for uh, decreasing uh, secretions as well. And um, so they have a controlled phase of breathing, a phase where their thorax is expanding, and then a forced expiration. So here's kind of the cycle, breathing control, a couple of deep breaths, breathing control, a couple of deep breaths, and then they start to huff and cough. Um, so it started by th diaphragmatic breathing, followed by three or four deep breaths. Each are held for three seconds, and then they passively exhale, and uh, then repeat. Passively exhale, and then repeat. So regular breathing, three or four deep breaths, hold it three seconds, force an exhale, repeat. Okay, this, uh, we can do it for several seconds or so, several minutes until the patient feels the need to cough. And then once they are um, feeling the need to cough, they can start doing the huffing exercises uh, and they can eventually do either assisted cough or just a regular cough. It milks the secretions up the airway from uh, smaller to larger airways so that they're being able to be removed more um, effectively. So the ACBT is really the most effective. It uses the deep breathing and the huffing combined, and it is the most effective. Um, it's just as effective as postural drainage, percussion, and shaking, which is great. It's great news because percussion, postural drainage, and shaking takes a lot of energy from the therapist, and that's fine if you're there, but this is something that can do when you're not there. All right, breathing exercises. So Pursed lip breathing um, can help. 
delay or prevent the collapse of airways in patients with COPD. So when their um, airways shut prematurely and it traps the air in, if they're doing that purse lip breathing, it's forcing the exhale. So it's forcing the airways to stay open. So it can help prevent that from happening. Um, although diaphragmatic breathing is taught a lot, there's not as much evidence to support its use in people who have pulmonary dysfunction. So it's very helpful in people who have um, pelvic floor issues or um, have uh, core weakness or uh, different things like that. But in pulmonary dysfunction, there's less evidence that shows the benefits of diaphragmatic breathing. It still may be taught, but um, it would be ideal to teach more of the purse lip breathing. Um, you can also strengthen the accessory muscles um, so that their breathing is more, uh, ventilation may be more effective. And um, that also is preferred over diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, spirometer, spirometer is like that little machine you blow in, you see the ball raising up to different levels based on how hard you're blowing. It can help patients to have a visual and realize how far they're going and also track progress and it can help increase the strength and endurance of your respiratory muscles. So personally, lift breathing is essentially just a forced exhale, like you're blowing out candles. Uh, so um, that's all you're teaching the patient to do with that purse lift breathing. Take a big, deep breath and then force that exhale, push it out. All right, some of the goals of breathing exercises in general, to decrease dyspnea, that's your labored breathing, to increase the strength of the ventilation muscles, to increase the endurance, and to uh, decrease labored breathing. <laughs> decrease dyspnea a second time. Some of the positions that you can use to teach diaphragmatic uh, breathing. I personally have seen it most often in the clinic in supine. That's how uh, it's taught most often. I think people can really relax in that position and get a good feel of is my chest rising or is my stomach rising. You want um, everything to expand. What you don't want is everything just to lift up because then you're primarily using your um, other muscles of breathing rather than your diaphragm. So you want kind of everything to fully expand out and not just to raise up. But you can teach it in a seated position. The main thing is you want a neutral spine and the head aligned with the trunks. You can do an upright posture. You can also do supine. That would be fun. Some general things that we want to tell the caregivers and the patients as well. You can teach them about the disease itself, the anatomy, the physiology. You can teach them about proper nutrition, about stress management, relaxation. If it's anything that's beyond your scope, just refer them to somebody else. Don't give them an eating plan. Refer them to a nutritionist, but you could just tell them it's really important to eat in order to have the proper nutrients to heal and to allow your body to function at its best. You know, something that's within your scope without giving them specific advice of eat this and avoid that. That's not really within our scope. You could teach them about the benefits of being smoke-free, um, about how oxygen is delivered throughout the body, you could uh, tell them and explain to them what diagnostic tests were done and what they mean. <clears throat> and then with COPD specifically, and remember that includes emphysema and chronic bronchitis, you can teach them about environmental factors that affect it, psychosocial aspects of it, and management of the um, disorder. So a lot of these things are going to be taught by the medical doctor or by nursing staff by medical staff, not necessarily specific to the PT. We can kind of touch on these subjects, but this is just general education that needs to happen to pulmonary patients. Typically, it's going to be given by other medical staff. But the, the education that the PT can give, you can educate them about postural drainage, about proper positionings, about chest PT, what it is, what it does about exercises, the effects, things that they need to avoid, contraindications, how to adhere, you know, what we expect and what we need you to do while we're gone, uh, energy saving techniques, airway clearance techniques, and then community resources. You can always refer them to others that would be um, needed as well. All right, so exercise prescription. 
um, how we determine what level of exercise the patient needs. So if they are trying to, if you're wanting to do moderate intensity training, you're trying to achieve 40 to 60% of their VO2 max. Um, and VO2 max is determined by an exercise tolerance test so that if they have had that done, that should be written in their chart somewhere. It's not something you necessarily have to determine while you're seeing them. If they, uh, if you're wanting vigorous activity, then you could even go up above 60% of their VO2 max. Um, it has been shown that short duration, high intensity exercises with frequent rest breaks or with low intensity of training between, so kind of that hit interval training, high intensity, quick duration, and then either low intensity or, or rest completely in between um, has really um, been shown to be most effective. High intensity, short duration with frequent rest breaks is the most effective in producing the training effect. And of course, we do want the training effect because we do want these people to be able to breathe better and have more efficient use of what they have. Um, so you could prescribe exercises that keep them within their target heart rate range. This is really a wide, safe range for exercise intensity. Let's say maybe they haven't had an exercise tolerance test, then you could do things to keep them in their target heart rate range. And that's typically 40 to 85% of their maximum heart rate. Um, so you... Um, figure out their heart rate max. It's usually 220 minus the age. And then you take away the resting heart rate and multiply it by 40, by 40%, 0.4, and then add back in their heart rate at rest. I was just trying to figure out why we were taking it away, sorry. Um, so that's what the book says to do. Take their maximum heart rate minus the resting heart rate. Multiply it by whatever percent you're wanting. 40%, you do 0.4. 85, you do 0.85. Then add their heart rate back in, and that gives you the lower and upper limits to um, what they what their target heart rate range is for um, exercise. So you could also determine that and monitor their heart rate to determine if they're, they're in the appropriate range. We're almost done here. Um, you can also use the RPE scale. You guys are familiar with that. There's one that's 0 to 12. There's several different scales. There's one in your book. I have the page number listed below. But if they're using the 0 to 12 scale, then they typically need to be around a 3 to a 5 on that scale, which correlates with about 60 to 78% of their VO2 max. Um, if you're using rate of perceived shortness of breath, that's similar to this scale over here. Oh, it got cut off a little bit. Um, then they also need to be a three to a six where they're, you know, moderately short of breath. So that correlates to 50 to 80% of their VO2 max. Um, it's recommended that people get 20 to 30 minutes, um, of exercise daily, uh, within their prescribed intensity. But for patients who are able to, um, I say daily, if they are able to do 20, 30, 20 to 30 minutes of continuous exercise without rest, then it's recommended for them to do that at least three to five times a week. Daily would be even better, but at least three to five times a week. So if they can tolerate 20 to 30 minutes, continuous activity without rest, three to five times a week. If they cannot tolerate 20 minutes without resting, then it's recommended for them to perform one to two daily sessions. So basically go as long as you can tolerate. If that's 10 minutes, then do exercise for 10 minutes. Rest later that day, do another 10 minutes. Um, so every day and with the um, goal of increasing their tolerance to at least 20 to 30 minutes. All right, so safe progression. You need to always talk to the supervising PT to determine what's safe. Um, if the patient's saying it feels too easy or if they're able to do... Um, uh, the same exercise they've been doing with a lower heart rate, then it may be time to progress. If um, that you are progressing, we're focusing on increasing the duration first, the amount of time they can perform continuous activity before we increase the difficulty level, you know, um, resistance or um, 
difficulty, you know, heels, stairs, all that. If they're able to tolerate 20 minutes of continuous activity, then you can start increasing the duration and the intensity of the exercise. So first you're focusing on having them just perform continuous activity, trying to get up to 20 minutes. Once they reach 20 minutes, you can start making the activities a little more difficulty. Um, and then you just determine how much to increase it based on their tolerance. You can use the baseline dyspnea scale. There's a page number below on where that can be found in your book uh, to determine how short a breath they are and how ready they are for exercise progression. Um, if they're pretty high and barely making it at the exercise they're having now, do not progress. But if they're pretty low and they just say, nah, I'm, you know, slightly out of breath, then you could probably ex uh, uh, progress that exercise. All right, when do we stop exercising? When do we think, oh no, it's too much? If they are completely short of breath, <laughs> there's also a page number below um, where you can find this in the book. If their carbon di uh, dioxide pressure uh, increases more than 20 millimeters of mercury or, mercury or goes above 65 millimeters of mercury, um, that's your their PaCO2, so partial um, pressure of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide pressure. Okay, but, um, yeah, and then uh, if they start to have chest pain or uh, changes in their heart rate or rhythm, arrhythmias, if they're starting to complain that they're significantly fatigued, if their um, diastolic blood pressure raises more than 20 millimeters of mercury or their systolic goes above 250, if their blood pressure doesn't raise <laughs> in spite of the workload raising because it should raise some, if they're having leg pain, because that could be that intermittent claudication. If they are having signs of insufficient cardiac output, like maybe they're turning pale or they're sweating or they um, are having cyanosis, you know, that blue around their mouth, anything like that. Or if they're reaching their ventilatory maximum, if they're just breathing as hard as they can, you need to stop that exercise and let them rest. How do we... Uh, quantify the patient's response. So this is our SOAP note. This is what do we need to put in the SOAP note to make sure we're um, collecting the appropriate data we need to monitor their oxygen saturation and write that down, their heart rate, what they're feeling on the dyspnea scale, on the RPE scale, how far they're able to walk or how long they're able to continue um, exercise, how often they have to take rest breaks and how long those rest breaks are. Um, and drainage clearance. All those things can be used to kind of show where the patient is at and to show progress over time. And these are some things that we will do in lab and practice together when we um, meet in lab. So let me know if you have any questions um, and I will see you in lab.